me uh, to come tonight, and uh, he said I could talk about anything. So I <laughs> I picked my own topic, but um, I and I don't know that you have a format um, at all. So I'll just sort of start talking and ask questions, interrupt me at will, and uh, we'll see where it where it goes. Um, one of the things that I study is um, the way that law and policies um, perpetuate, create and perpetuate inequality. Um, and I focus on um, criminal justice systems um, in part of my work. And that's what I wanted to focus on tonight. It's not always obvious. Uh, I mean, it is, I guess, when you think about it. But when you start to think about equality, the first thing you think of are the economic um, policies that are put into place. Um, but the criminal justice system is a big part of how this is perpetuated. Um, those at the um, bottom of the socioeconomic ladder are disproportionately, as you all know, um, minorities, women, children, and uh, women of color, of course, being on the lowest rung. But there's um, so many factors uh, that go into this. And, and so I'll take you back a little bit, uh, not too far, well, <laughs> we'll go back and forth. But um, beginning in the 1970s, um, and then with a vengeance in the 1980s, our criminal justice system rejected this um, notion that had been put in place in the progressive era, and then again by uh, the new left in the um, uh, 1960s that really focused uh, the criminal justice system on rehabilitation and uh, treatment. It said, you know, it looked at the uh, causes of crime as sociological. It said the reason that people commit crimes are for all sorts of sociological reasons, poverty being among them, not the only cause. Um, but that it isn't um, a rational choice theory of crime causation that's perpetuating the problems that we have in the United States. So the rational choice theory is the idea that a person says, um, I'm going to benefit from committing this particular crime. Like, let's say I want a television. My television broke. I want a new one. I see one through this window. It's beautiful. <laughs> and I'm going to go take it. And let me see. What are the penalties that could happen to me? What's the chance that I'm going to get caught? If I do get caught, what's the chance that, you know, something bad will happen to me? And so you weigh those benefits and those possible harms, and then you make a decision. Okay, it doesn't look like anybody's home. There's no alarm system. There's nobody on the block. Nobody will see me. I can get in and out. I'm going to take it. Or this is a high visible area. You know, a chance that I'll get caught is really likely, so I'm not going to take it, right? So everybody who goes to commit a crime goes through that process. That's the theory, right? So the way to stop crime under that kind of a theory is to make a harsher penalty, right? You're more likely to get caught, and if you get caught, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. So then the benefit wouldn't outweigh the cost. But the reality is that almost no one goes through that kind of an analysis, right, before they commit a crime. Most people um, are committing crimes because they're... Um, uh, have some sort of substance abuse problem. So they're stealing so that they can get money so that they can buy drugs. Or they're living in dire poverty. They have no other options. They can't get an education. Or everybody around them, this is part of an underground economy. This is the way that they are in their living. <coughs> Almost no one goes through this kind of um, thought process of I'm going to weigh the benefits and the costs and make a decision. Who Can you think of anyone who does go through that kind of a analysis before they commit a crime? Yeah, the 1%. Yeah, yeah. He said the white-collar crime is the, are the people who are most likely to go through that analysis. Exactly. So those are the people who should have the harshest penalties, right? Because that would make sense. If they're going through that analysis, then make the penalties stronger. And we do just the opposite, right? The penalties that, of white-collar crimes are the easiest, the softest kinds of penalties. They're much less likely to get caught. If they are, they're much less likely to be prosecuted. If they are prosecuted, they're much less likely to get any sort of a, a, a jail sentence. For the people who don't go through that process, the people who have sub substance abuse problems or, or who are living in poverty, those kinds of responses would be, obviously, to 
give them treatment, right, to help them uh, try to overcome their addictions, to give them job training, to get them um, an education, to get them a job, right, to put them in a position where the things that are causing the crime no longer exist. But our system doesn't do that. Uh, beginning, as I said, in the 1970s and then in the 1980s with a vengeance, we said, get tough on crime. And get tough on crime meant we're going to have harsher sentences, they're going to be longer, they're going to, we're going to put in, we're going to take away judicial discretion, right? We're not going to let judges let people off anymore. We're going to say you have a minimum mandatory sentence that you have to um, serve, uh, that if you commit certain numbers of crimes, right, three strikes and you're out, then you go to prison forever. And there's all kinds of stories um, in the literature that show people who um, have committed really minor uh, crimes on their third crime. One of the uh, uh, cases that I teach is um, uh, uh, Leandro Andretti, who was a man who had served uh, the military, had gone to war, had come home from the war, and was uh, had a, a drug problem. He became addicted to drugs. He had very little money um, and uh, you know, had never committed any kind of violent crime. He, all of his crimes, the two prior crimes, were theft for theft, for not much money, right, for small things. So his third crime was that he went into Kmart and he stole uh, uh, six uh, kid, children's videotapes. It was November, he had some nieces and nephews, he didn't have any money to buy them Christmas presents, so he wanted to steal um, some videotapes to give them for Christmas. It was his third strike. In uh, He was in California. In California, your third strike doesn't have to be a felony. If you have two prior felony convictions, your third strike could be a misdemeanor. And he was sentenced to life in prison. Life in prison, a vet, right, for stealing six videotapes. So we, you know, these are the kinds of uh, consequences of, of these uh, types of, of policies. And um, we put them into place from the administration, uh, Congress, um, the courts, uh, the jails, the prisons, everybody's in on it, right? All of these um, uh, um, parts of the wheel um, help make the um, uh, jail population and the prison population skyrocket. Um, so there's lots of people that have talked about this, right, written about it for a long time. Um, Jeffrey Ryman is one of the uh, early uh, people to identify um, this um, uh, phenomenon. He wrote a book in the late 1970s called The Rich Get Richer and the Poor Get Prison. H have any of you read it? No? Okay. It's now in its ninth edition, right? The latest edition was just published last year. And the theories are still the same. They've only gotten stronger. He has more evidence now um, than he ever had. So Ryman argues that the real goal of the criminal justice system is not to reduce crime, but to maintain the image that crime is caused by poor people, right? It's all about image. And his argument is that the criminal justice system's failure to reduce crime is its goal, because that benefits those people who are in power. He wants everybody from the middle class to be looking down looking down at the people who are poor, looking down at the people who are causing crime, because then they won't look up, right? Yeah. And What's the name of the book again? The um, uh, Rich Get Richer, the Poor Get Prison. And it's uh, Jeffrey Ryman. Yeah, I mean, it was, he, I think the first edition was published in 1979, and I think the ninth edition was published in 2010, and it's uh, uh, going strong. So um, he broadcasts... Um, a really potent ideological message to the American people that protects the powerful and the privileged and therefore legitimates the social order with its poor-rich divide. And as I said, diverts public discontent and op opposition away from the rich um, and the powerful onto the poor and the powerless. Um, and it does this in part by making the crimes of the poor dangerous, right? The offenses of the rich are seen as benign. The total opposite, that because the one percent, their influence is so vast, it's just their crimes affect huge amounts of people. Yeah, right. Yeah. But they're not portrayed that way, right? Mm -hmm. They're portrayed as, oh, uh -huh. these aren't real crimes, right. right? And the crimes of the poor stealing videotapes, mm -hmm. 
you know, that will undo our society. And I mean, all of this has just been, you know, what, right before our eyes um, over the last couple of years. I mean, it's never so evident as it is now. Ryman's been making this argument, you know, for but, um, like the difference between, you know, getting a sentence for crack and, and you know, powder. 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 Right. Pain. Right. Pain. right. Right, and that's been reduced by the Obama administration a little bit, right? I mean, it's better now than it was, but not much. But it's still the same kinds of problems, mm -hmm. exactly. I, yeah. I don't recall the author, but the name of the book is uh, Smoke and Mirrors, and it's a history of the war on drugs. So, uh, that author writes that uh, powdered cocaine wasn't really even considered much of a drug problem before, before crack came along. Oh, well, that's just a few rich white kids. Yeah, because you're <laughs> <laughs> right. the government was shipping it in. Right, right, <laughs> right, 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 right. And so we're going to talk about that uh, some more in just a second. But um, uh, not only do they make the poor crimes of the poor seem more dangerous, they also then propose uh, prison as the consequence, right? So they put more and more people... Um, in prison. And then they say, look at all these poor people in prison. That's proof of how dangerous they are, right? And, and this problem. How dangerous our society is. <laughs> yeah. And isn't prison also a business that in and of itself, if you get the people in there, you're providing long-term money for yourself? Absolutely. Well, they get paid a dollar a day to labor, and I saw this somewhere today, and five dollars for a minute of a phone call? Oh, you know, right. Yeah. Yeah, tooth, the cost of toothpaste, you know, yeah, everything while you're Federal in prison. industrial complex. Right. <laughs> but even more than that, and I think this might be part of what you're getting at, is um, the growth of privatization of prisons, right? Mm -hmm. And the more that we make this a, a private enterprise, then the conditions go down, they're harder to regulate, right? We have less oversight, and it's just for profit. And in um, states where you are having an explosion of private prisons, the prison companies are influencing legislation and pushing the third strike you're out kind of legislation right. so that they gain more people living in their prisons to for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, right. And and labor. they come back. Nice right. slave labor. Yeah, yeah. And it you know, there's there's historical roots for that, um, which I'll talk about in just a second as well. So um Ryman argues that the role of the government in the uh, American criminal justice system is not to protect its citizens against crime, and never has been, right? even though it might pretend to, to, that it is. Um, but it's really to use the law, the courts, the legal actors, the prisons to keep the criminal population, to keep a large criminal population, and a population that consists primarily of poor people, before our eyes. Um, and he argues that this has been done piecemeal, I don't know if he if he's gotten stronger over the years. I haven't read the latest editions of his book. I, I, initially, he was a little uh, reluctant to say that this was a purposeful program, right? He argued more that it was um, it, it uh, came together piecemeal through programs and strategies that broadcast and perpetuated this version, but vision, but wasn't necessarily done, you know, as a conspiracy. He may have changed uh, that position a little bit um, as it's become more obvious and hasn't changed, right? Um, but he argues that um, all of these things, the media especially, newspapers, televisions now, of course, social media, um, uh, come together to persu persuade the American people that the real dangers that they face, again, come from below and not from above. Um, Studies have found that the crimes that poor people commit are more, um, are more likely to be crimes for which they are arrested, charged, convicted, sentenced, and for longer terms. And so part of it is the, the legislature and the way that they draft these laws, but the other part of it is, is that we don't provide the kinds of services that poor people need, right? If you can't afford an attorney, the chance that you're going to be convicted skyrockets. Um, and so that's another part of, of the problem. Um, so uh, there's a bias in determining um, what is a crime as well, not just among um, the economic policies of the 1%, but also the businesses that they run, right? What's pollution? 
-hmm. Is pollution a crime? Right? The healthcare industry, the things that doctors do, right, aren't considered crimes, even though they feel criminal to us, right, when they've been done to us. But we don't, uh, uh, we don't have laws that make those crimes. But we do have laws that make public order crimes criminal, right? We make things that have, there's no victim, right? Gambling, you know, drinking underage, you know, drug use, all of those things. We put these, we make those criminal when there are things, I mean, the, the, uh, These are all nonviolent things as well. Nonviolent, victimless crimes. Pot smoking is illegal, but money laundering through packs is not. Right. Pot smoking is With illegal, but nuclear <laughs> bombs. I, I find I, I've always found it very humorous that Illinois statute specifically has to tell you that insurance is exempt from gambling statutes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of says it is. Right, right. Hey, I'll bet you won't have an earthquake. Right. <laughs> well, you think about. I mean, the example I always like to use is uh, the Ford Pinto cases. I mean, these that dates me shows how old I am, but <laughs> these were the cases where. Uh, when uh, it was in the um, 1980s, and the um, uh, we, you know we have an energy crisis, and so you know people need to buy small cars, and there was this big push to buy small cars, and so Ford didn't have a small car on the market, so it had this Pinto in design, so it hurried up the process of of uh, creating this, finishing the design, getting it on the market, and they of course cut a bunch of corners. So now the Ford Pinto's out there, people are buying it up because it's supposed to be smaller and better gas mileage and all of this, only there was a tragic flaw. And that was that the engine was um, in the back where if you've got uh, just a, a fender bender, right, somebody just taps you, it doesn't have to be a bad accident, it, the car blows up. Didn't Ralph Fender wear a book Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so, so they, Ford becomes aware of this problem after people start dying from being burned to death inside their car from, you know, these explosions. So they go to Ford and they say, hey, this car is, you know, flawed in its design and you need to recall it and, and fix it. And they, decide, they did a calculation and they decided that, no, economically it would be better for them to leave the cars on the road and then just pay out for the few people that died. Mm -hmm. That died. Settle out of court with them. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. well, and they made that involved. they made that decision, cold, calculated decision. So there was an accident um, in I think it was Indiana. I'm not sure, but I think it was Indiana, where this you know the flawed design of the car caused someone to die, and so the uh, pro uh, prosecutor in Indiana said, "I'm going to charge uh, these uh, people at Ford with uh, murder." Because at this point, they knew, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, they lost. They could not convict them, right? So who do we convict? And who, uh, who, what crimes are crimes? And, you know, um, who goes to prison? <laughs> I mean, I, ca I can't imagine a more blatant case, right? All right, so th now to get to what you all keep bringing up, the drug wars, right? Um, <laughs> Michelle Alexander um, has written a book called uh, The New Jim Crow. And oh, I brought it with me because there's a subtitle. And I'll buy it. Um, the New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness. And I know Chris has read it. <laughs> because I've I, written about it. <laughs> I, because I, oh, in the, for this? Hmm? You've written about it for this, or for no? The class? I've written about yeah. it in class. Yeah. So um, uh, I think that this is a, a follow-up. It sounds like to some of the uh, other. She's not the first one to write about the drug wars, um, but she is one of the later ones, and she really focuses on um, the uh, racial implications behind this system as well, right? Um, so she starts. Uh, off tracing the systems that have been instituted in American society from slavery forward to maintain a racial caste system. Um, it was in place at the founding, right? Slavery was um, alive and well um, when we uh, wrote the Declaration of Independence and when we passed our Constitution. Um, both of these documents grounded in principles of liberty and equality, and yet um, we have a racial caste system that's perpetuated 
um, to today. Um, she talked about, she talks, she sort of traces this history from slavery um, after um, uh, the Civil War when we're supposed to, you know, have abolished slavery and not have a caste system anymore and how quickly um, the, the moment of reconstruction that we had that actually tried to have some sort of uh, racial equality eroded away. Um, black codes were put in place in the South, um, and this convict lease system uh, was created. And W.E.B. Du Bois wrote about it uh, back um, at the time, turn, around the turn of the 20th century, um, and uh, um, others you know, have talked about it as well. And it, here it is, right? You have the South. They've lost their labor system, right? Their free labor system from the, those that they had enslaved. So now they need somehow to get a labor system back. All of the, the South is still dependent on an agricultural um, uh, market. And uh, so they pass vagrancy laws. They say, if you aren't working, then you, that's a crime. And they only enforce them against African Americans. And they put them in jail. And then they make, the jail makes contracts with the plantation owners, right, to say, okay, you know, send us uh, the prisoners to do work for free <laughs> on our farms. So it's the convict lease system. It's slavery reenacted, only now they're using the criminal justice system, right? Um, and uh, so that works for a while. Um, they're able to maintain that uh, um, uh, for quite a while. The other problem with Reconstruction, and a lot of people, again, have talked about this, is that they left all of the property in the hands of white uh, landowners, right, wealthy white uh, men. And so there's no means to overcome, um, you know, the poverty um, that most of these people were freed into, right? Um, so uh, then, uh, you know, we have the system of segregation that develops, right? And it says, okay, well, if we can't have the black codes anymore, at least we can keep everyone separate. At least we can say, you know, you can't, uh, uh, based on your color, go to these schools, go to these restaurants, live in this part of town, work in these jobs, right? And as you know, I'm sure Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, pretty much constitutionalizes separate um, but equal. Um, they say that the 14th Amendment allows for um, separate but equal to stand. And so, you know, finally, um, more than 50 years later, almost 60 years later, we have a Supreme Court decision that deconstitutionalizes separate but equal, Brown versus Board of Education, that says, no, separate is unequal. But then we can't seem to get that enforced, right? It takes forever um, for the courts. And, you know, arguably today, we still have segregated schools. There's very few schools, uh, certainly um, uh, the better schools, right, that have um, a uh, uh, mixed population. Um, white flight has allowed um, uh, the separation within the schools to continue, even though it's not legal. And the ACLU right? will not talk about it either. So don't even try. <laughs> really? Right. No, they will not. And I've, I've called them and complained. Why aren't you pushing, um, you know, Brown versus Board of Education to be, you know, implemented? You know, yeah. They just act like you're crazy. Yeah. You know, but clearly it's not. You're obviously right. Yeah. There is huge discrimination in the education system. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 